Good afternoon. My name is Ingrid Fersing. I am an art historian. I have been promoting Nordic art and literature in France, in Paris, for a long time. And I am now established in Denmark. Uh, as a member of uh, the scientific committee of the festival, I was very eager to present contemporary uh, architecture, Danish contemporary architecture, to the festival. Therefore, I'm really pleased today to be part of this uh, round table as a facilitator with two le leading uh, specialists. <laughs> Christopher Linhard Weiss is an art historian, former co-owner of a Danish architecture studio Effect. He has represented Denmark in a number of Danish and international exhibition projects, including the Venice Biennale of Architecture in 2006, which earned the Golden Lion for Best National Pavilion. Christopher published widely. He is uh, the director of uh, Architectens Farley, the Danish architectural press. Martin Söber is an art historian. His PhD thesis is on architecture, focused on sketches in architecture. He's assistant professor in architectural history at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts School of Architecture. Martin is also the president of the Danish Association of Art Historians. <coughs> During the last 30 years, Denmark and distinctly Copenhagen entered a period of drastic transformation in all aspects of architectural and urban achievement, such as transport infrastructures with the creation of a subway, the major extension of the airport, the construction of bridges redrawing new geographical areas between Denmark and Sweden, for example. Old brick institutional buildings such as the Royal Danish Library, the Opera House, or the Royal uh, Danish Theater put on a new dress of stone and glass. New housing started to develop to a point that whole new district emerged within the city. And in the last 20 years, the Danish architectural firms have translated in a quite new way their understanding of today's and tomorrow's world. A world subjected to the consequences of the climate crisis and the increasing globalization, population, urbanization. This created such a breakthrough that we can talk about a new wave in Danish architecture to quote the title of one of your reference book on the subject, Christopher. Today, Martin and Christopher will introduce you to this new architectural statement. Their presentation is designed like a walk through the city and its new construction. Each lecture will last 15 minutes, and they will be followed by a sharing moment, hoping that their presentations will raise questions and subjects of debate. You are very welcome to dig further through specific questions after this half-hour stroll. While preparing this round table, the three of us agreed on the crucial, crucial aspect of the climate crisis we are currently facing, and we all agree that it is not one of the many subjects to approach, but the crucial, critical, compelling reason for today's architectural and urbanistic changes. Both of you have chosen to address the topic of the Danish new wave from this standpoint. Would you like to start, Martin? Thank you. All right, I hope the mic is fine. Um, first of all, thank you for this very generous in um, invitation to participate in the festival. It's uh, very kind of the organizers, and I'm also very pleased to be part of this panel today, this afternoon. Um, Christopher and I both have a presentation, and mine, as you can see here, is focused on public spaces, and maybe it's a good start since the topic of the festival this year is also the people. So 
I'm not going to reflect so much on what is the meaning of public space today, because I think that's really a longer discussion of what's the point of public spaces and the meaning and the function of public space in an urban context today. But I will show you some examples of recent projects from Copenhagen that at least could give you some ideas of the tendencies uh, within architectural design of these urban spaces in Copenhagen. And that will also point to um, some of the interest of contemporary Danish architects and all the other people, the municipality, organizations that help bring about these projects. Um, I will show you six different projects and it, I've tried to sort of organize them into different categories. Um, maybe it's not so recognizable, but at least I'll try to point out some specific interests and topics uh, with these uh, selected projects. Um, I have a few examples of like more classic, you could say, urban public spaces, hard surface public spaces. Um, I have some projects that are connected with infrastructure. I think that's a very important part. That's also something that was addressed by Ingrid in her uh, introduction, the upgrading of the contemporary infrastructure in the city. And finally, some projects that deal with climate change and the adaptation of the urban scene to climate changes and what have been done within urban spaces to actually deal with these changes of the urban climate. So I'll sort of go through these examples just to give you an idea of what's happening, what has happened within the past sort of 10 years, five to 10 years in Copenhagen. So the first project I will uh, introduced to you is called Questus Molen. It's probably impossible <laughs> to translate that. Um, it's a project on the harbor front of Copenhagen, and Ingrid mentioned some of these big cultural projects that have been built within the past 10 to 20 years in Copenhagen that mark as a shift in Copenhagen where the harbor is being transformed from an industrial harbor also a part in general of the, or an aspect of the general urban transformation in Copenhagen from an industrial city to the post-industrial city, uh, or maybe we even beyond that. But it means that a lot of spaces along the harbor have been um, opened. They have been, uh, it ha it's been possible to change and regenerate some of these public spaces uh, into different programs. New um, museums, cultural houses, the opera, the theater have been built along the harbor, and also some public spaces. It's just some historical photos to give you an idea of what, how did the harbor look like some decades ago, full of traffic, cargo, ships coming in from all over the world. Copenhagen is, after all, a harbor city, and that's the historical basis for Copenhagen. Actually, it's in its name that it's Houghton, it's a harbor city. And this is a very central pier, uh, right in the middle of Copenhagen, right in the middle of the harbor. Uh, you can't see it on these photographs, but actually, um, in the one to the left, part of this area is where the new playhouse, the Skuespilhuse, has been built within, I think, about 10 years ago by the same firm that's converted this pier. And here's how, how it looks today. It's actually a very simple transformation of this space. It's been transformed into a public scene, you could say. That was the idea, since this public space is located right next to the playhouse, that it should be able to accommodate new programs, changing functions, and also sometimes uh, the theater could use it for public interventions and maybe even outdoor plays. So it's a very simple concrete surface. It has some of the a uh, roughness of the harbor, also some iron metal features, and it has these very simple lines that have been scratched into the wet concrete surface before it dried up. So it has this, it sort of uh, reacts to the sunlight, as you can see, the low Nordic sunlight. There are a few pavilions that can also accommodate different programs, cafes, for instance, bars, uh, all clad in metal, tombak metal, as you can see, and they sort of form a line. It's a new horizon in the harbor, as this picture suggests. 
a very long pier that just stretches into the harbour. And here you can see the end of it. It's right in the, right in the point in the harbour where it sort of opens up. The part of the harbour feels more like a river, but here it sort of opens up towards the sea, um, the Baltic Sea that surrounds Copenhagen if you go further out. You can just glimpse the royal palace in the background and also some of the old uh, warehouses in the background. Right by the end of this pier, it sort of slides into the water and sort of articulates the waves, the tides uh, in the water. So it's, very, it's a very poetic, very, very simple intervention. And it has this huge open public space that can be used. And it's a very popular space to hang out in uh, during summer days. The next project I will show you is also an urban uh, square, or piazza, that has been regenerated. It's a little bit more urban. It has a little bit more urban feel. It's called Israel's Place, or Israel's Square. It's in an area where the historical ramparts used to be situated, the fortification of Copenhagen that were torn down in the middle of the 19th century, in the 1850s. Um, after that, new houses were built. The city was expanded during the 19th century. Um, the houses surrounding this square was uh, a little bit upper class housing. And the vegetable market was located right in this urban space. It's actually one of the biggest urban spaces in Copenhagen, or at least historically it used to be. But it also functioned as a parking space, as you can see here, for a number of years, um, which meant that it, it didn't have that many public qualities, so many programs to actually uh, offer a public. It was decided to transform it. There was an existing parking uh, facility underneath this square that had been established, I think, in the 1970s. But that was also upgraded. And here you can see the new intervention. Some new market halls were created for the vegetable market, but also for, uh, it's a food market for all kinds of uh, um, foods. It's located right next to one of the public parks in Copenhagen, which is actually sort of a leftover of the old ramparts. So the lake that you see in the background is actually a remain of the moat that was surrounding Copenhagen historically as part of the defense of Copenhagen. And this uh, fortification is actually re reflected in the design of this, spare, uh, of this square. Maybe you can see that the corners of the square sort of lift up a little bit. You can see in the upper left corner and the lower right corner. The square sort of lifts up a little bit. And that's to reflect um, where the ramparts used to be. So there were ramparts right there and a lower part in between. And there's actually now a water element. Maybe you can see that, a very narrow water element that sort of reflects the history that there used to be a water element there, the moat protected Copenhagen. New programs have been introduced, new sports facilities, as you can see here, basketball courts. And it's a very, very popular, it's really in the central center of Copenhagen, so it's a very popular space to hang out and just sit, maybe play some sports, or just look at people, or maybe you'd go shopping in the market halls right next to it. Just around the corner from this space is the Nørreport station, and it's actually Denmark's busiest railway station. So it's a very, very populated space, very, very crowded. It used to look like this. Here are some historical pictures. One is maybe from the beginning of the 20th century, the other one more recent. And as you can see, it was full of traffic lanes, roads, uh, just a few facilities accommodating the station, but it was not really a public space where you would want to hang out or spend um, some time. The office of Kober, a Danish architectural office, made some analysis prior to the conversion of this space. They mapped where pedestrians actually, how they move about in this space. As you can see here, all the fine lines are trackings of the movements of pedestrians. And that was actually determined for the design of the facilities in this space. 
So the white areas are where the new facilities, the new pavilions accommodating the station uh, are located. And all the, also the shapes of these facilities are uh, determined by these lines of the movements of the pedestrians. So a very pragmatic attitude, we just simply map where are people moving, where they, what are the connection lines, and that will actually inform the design. And here you can see an aerial view. You can see the Israel Square in the background. Um, and you can see that these figures, these forms, informed by the mapping, uh, are actually executed here. Another important feature in this um, transformation is that the roads were shifted to one side. So there was a traffic, um, a change of tra traffic patterns here, which created new public spaces closer to the shopping areas. So this is, in a way, an, an opening. This is the entrance to the, some of the main shopping areas of Copenhagen. And maybe you can see at the lower part of this station area, new open public spaces have been created where people can move about more freely by foot or also by bike. Yeah, one of the pavilions, they attempted to give the um, architecture that it should be as light and as open as possible. As you can also see here, this is towards the road. A new island that would accommodate all the very, very many bikes in this area. As you probably know, Copenhageners like to bike as much as possible. I think it's a third of everyone living in Copenhagen that go by bike every day to their job or to their studies, wherever they're going. So these islands were designed, they're a little bit lower than the rest of the areas, and they can accommodate more than 2,000 bikes in these islands. And it's just one by night. Another project that accommodates bikes is the bicycle snake. Ingrid uh, mentioned how Danes like to build bridges, and here are some examples of some smaller bridges in Copenhagen that have been built in order to connect areas of the city that were not connected previously. Um, as you can see here, this is an area that was built on former harbour land. There's a huge shopping centre to the lower right, uh, but also some new housing uh, areas. And in order to connect this with an area that's on the opposite side of the harbour, here it's more narrow, it looks almost like a river. First there was this a white bridge was created, and finally this bicycle snake, the red one that you see uh, in the lower part of the image. It was created in order to connect this existing bridge with the roads that you see at the bottom of the picture, because before this, there's actually a shift in levels, and I think it's two stories, so it's a little bit difficult for bicyclists to actually move from this road and towards this other narrow bicycle bridge and pedestrian bridge towards the other side of the river. So now this bridge has been built, and it's a very, very popular connection for bicyclists uh, to actually go from one area of the city to another. And I think it expresses also the uh, ambition of the municipality, the Copenhagen municipality, the city, to accommodate bicyclists, to actually promote public transportation, as we saw with the station, but also bicycling, both in terms of that it's a healthy, but it's also a very easy and very fast way to move about in the city. Underneath, there are some recreational spaces with these um, spaces where you can lie down and enjoy the summer. There's a harbour bath where you can actually go swimming in the harbour, and here you see it at night. Finally, I have two projects that are more sort of landscape projects, but also have similar features to what we saw with some of the pre previous projects. And both of these projects are designed by the company called SLA. It's a landscape office based in Copenhagen. And both projects are dealing with climate adaptation, but in a little bit different ways. In 2010, the municipality decided to put down a strategy for the handling of future climate changes in Copenhagen. It was predicted that one of the major risks of climate changes in Copenhagen would be flooding, uh, with more heavy rainstorms coming up 
uh, in the coming years. So it was necessary to adopt the city, and you can do that in different ways. One way would be to enlarge the existing sewer system, but that's extremely expensive to dig into the ground and actually enlarge that. Instead of doing that, the municipality just decided to actually handle more of the rainwater on the ground and actually change a lot of the urban spaces to uh, allow more of the rainwater to be absorbed into the ground and uh, let it flow more freely and also let the drainage happen at a slower pace. So instead of having these huge floods where all the water is being pushed into the sewers, that would eventually not be able to handle uh, all the water. There would be an overspill into the harbour, maybe with polluted water. Um, they decided to have this uh, strategy of changing a lot of the urban spaces. It's a strategy that would l last for 20 years, so it will take a total of 20 years to transform Copenhagen towards this new scheme, but it's slowly happening uh, in a lot of places especially also with when new larger structures are being built. This is a new research and uh, educational facility built for the University of Copenhagen. It's actually not the building that I'm interested in here, but the park that's surrounding this facility. It's called Sund Natur Park, or you can translate it directly to health or healthy nature park. Uh, this is a facility for the medical faculty of the University of Copenhagen, so it's addressing health already. Uh, and it's surrounded by a park that's able to absorb some of the rainwater in Copenhagen. Um, you can see that some of the building also, buildings also have green roofs to absorb water. Uh, and there's also collection of some of the rainwater, the wastewater from the roofs of the building that is being reused within the building uh, for instance, for toilets, they're using this grey water from uh, the rain um, just to, to, make, uh, to use this uh, grey water. There's a 300 metre long bike a route. As you can see here, it's almost kind of a snake again uh, as a promenade where you can uh, cross the en entire area. It goes up to three storeys and you can have a look at the entire area. Uh, one um, uh, point of uh, inspiration or reference for this project was actually how this area used to look like um, prior to the development of this area. It's in the Nørrebro um, neighborhood, which is a very densely populated, uh, mainly a housing area, which was developed after the ramparts were demolished in the 19th century, so the second half of the 19th century. This is a painting um, from the beginning of the 19th century. This is by Christen Kupke, one of the famous painters of the, golden Danish, the Danish Golden Age. It's not the exact spot, but it gives you an idea of what did this area used to look like in the 19th century. This was an area for uh, cattle to grass, uh, so it's a very rural area, and that's some of the atmosphere that the architects have tried to introduce, so a very wild picture of nature in this area, even though it's very urban at the same time. So they introduced 60, uh, 60 different species of plants uh, into this area just to create this very lush, very wild atmosphere here. There are lots of terraces for the students or the researchers to take a break, or for people just to pass by on their bikes, as you can see here. So the idea is to have a very wild nature in this urban setting, and that's also part of the aesthetics of the SLA company, the architects. They're very interested in making these contrasts between the rationalism of uh, urbanity and the more wild and rich and lush, vigorous uh, image of nature, as you can see here. So it's a very particular aesthetic that's not so groomed, but very wild and very sensuous at the same time. They really emphasize that you should not only uh, have visual experiences here, but you should also be able to smell, touch, feel, and really be stimulated in very many different ways. 
as you can see here, there's, here's a little bit of the image of the meadow land that was located here um, before. The final project that I will show also by SLA, a little bit of the same um, features in this. It's a huge climate adaptation project uh, in the neighborhood of Österbo. Um, this is called the first climate district in Copenhagen, where there was a strategy to transform an entire neighborhood, not only on the roofs, but also in the private courtyards, as you can see here. Right in the middle of this um, neighborhood was quite a boring roundabout, as you can see here. It was a lawn with some trees, and it was transformed recently by the SLA to accommodate water flows, heavy rainfalls. You can see there are some basins that will sometimes be filled with water, sometimes they will dry up. And there are all kinds of wild nature features here and very, very many different kinds of trees and flowers. So it's extremely wild and maybe it clashes a little bit of our ideas of what would a city actually look like? How is a city supposed to look like? Because it's so rough. There are also some old trees there, actually some dead trees that they put there, because dead trees are very good for biodiversity, to introduce biodiversity into areas, because larves and uh, beetles and all kinds of insects will thrive from these uh, dead trees. So here you can see. And possibly, if there is a heavy rainfall, it might look like this someday, and it will accommodate the water, as you can see here. Okay. Thank you for the attention. That was uh, my presentation. I hope I haven't spoken for too long. Thank you very much, Martin. And thank you very much, Ingrid for that lovely introduction. I would love to be an art historian, but I'm actually educated in philosophy. <laughs> but I have great respect of your profession, I would say, and of the French language. I actually used to study here in, 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 in Paris, um, but I have too, too, such a, a deep respect of, of uh, the French language, so I will not even try to do this presentation in French. So I hope you will forgive me. Well, um, uh, so, Copenhagen as a city is a historic success, as you said, but it's also a fundamental failure. And that is a weird paradox. And of course, it's a lush city with a lot of money, a lot of wealth. Uh, but we are standing, as you all know, in a very deep crisis uh, where our sort of a carbon uh, footprint is like hysterical. Uh, it's actually outrageous. And in the architect community of Denmark, there is a sense of urgency. Uh, and it's reshaping the, the, the profession in a profound way. And I'll try to show you a few uh, projects here that sort of exemplifies that this change is real and that it's happening and that it will actually change the city. Um, this is my a book I published a few months ago. It's called Critical City. And it deals with this issue of this, uh, this crisis and how architects and urbanists are dealing with it. We are in the area of the post-industrial city. You showed some wonderful images, Martin, of the city. And, and of course, the harbor used to be an industrial infrastructure. It was a highway of, of sort of polluting uh, ships and heavy industry. And in Copenhagen, and that's part of the success, that's part of the miracle, uh, the harbor has been turned into a blue park. It's completely clean. The water's completely clean. You can bathe wherever you want in the harbor. Uh, so this is like uh, the welfare city has been realized. It's not a fantasy anymore. It's not utopia. The welfare city, uh, with all its offerings of livability and life quality, is sort of real. But in this sort of uh, moment where it's sort of topping out, things are beginning to happen. And uh, architects are, trying, are wondering, you know, what will replace the industrial city? What will the post-industrial city be like? And uh, one of the offices 
uh, is of course Bianchi Engels Group. And right now they're finishing a, a project. Uh, it's a former uh, waste plant in the middle of the city that used to be sort of a black spot on the city map, a uh, polluted spot, that is now turned into a, um, <laughs> a recreational uh, park. Uh, it's actually um, with a ski, ski slope on top of it, I'll show you. Um, so uh, what they're doing is that like uh, it's an icon of an urban change. Actually, the air is cleaner right next to the chimney on top of this building than it is on the parking lot. Because the, the, the climate technology is so good right now that you can actually clean the air from the waste plant to a degree that is completely safe to use as, um, as a public park. So they suggested to actually do, uh, as you probably know, uh, Denmark is flat like a pancake, uh, and Copenhagen is, as well. So they suggested to do, uh, but, but the Danes are among the people in Europe or in the world that actually ski the most. We just travel to, to France to do it, or Italy. So why not do a ski slope in the middle of Copenhagen, downtown Copenhagen? So there's the waste plant, and there is a, sort of this a route on top of it. And they do uh, like a, a park, and a public accessible, uh, publicly accessible park. Uh, on top of this, uh, of course, this is not Copenhagen, but uh, inside, uh, inside this uh, waste plant, we deal with all the, the garbage of uh, Copenhagen. And these are their uh, illustrations. They do like a small section of a ski slope uh, on a sort of a classical uh, ski resort and add it uh, on, top of this, uh, on top of this building. So uh, it's sort of an attempt to say that if we do clean the area enough, if we uh, use uh, all the environmental technologies that we actually have right now, we can create these uh, sort of fantastic urban spaces. Um, and I will show you, it's a, the ski shop is, this, uh, is the size of the Sochi half pipe. So it's actually a quite, uh, and the same uh, as steep, so it's actually a very big uh, feature. And as we speak, they're, they're finishing the project, and it will of course be a, a symbol of, um, of the new uh, uh, Copenhagen. So these architects are sort of uh, pushing the limits and really trying to evolve uh, this idea that uh, architecture should accommodate this, this change, and that if we, use these environmental technologies, we will actually be able to add a lot of value to public space. Uh, I, uh, I decided to include another project they're doing. It's actually in New York, but it's the same principle, that uh, what used to be uh, a huge uh, crisis can be turned into something uh, extraordinary. Uh, as you know, the, the Hurricane Sandy flooded uh, Manhattan and sort of uh, almost wiped out Lower Manhattan. And uh, after that, uh, the city of New York commissioned um, some architecture studios, among them big, in a competition to try to solve this problem of flooding, future flooding. And what they did was uh, quite ex extraordinary. They, they did a project they called the Big U, uh, where they dealt with this uh, overwhelming uh, crisis that cities also like Copenhagen uh, will face. Uh, that huge amounts of water will flood the city eventually. It's too late. So what, so what do we do with all these flood barriers? Could we turn them into fantastic recreational parks? And that's exactly what they're doing. They're building it right now. That they utilize the existing infrastructure, build new flood barriers that will focus on, the, on sort of the welfare needs of the needs of people, and uh, eventually turn it into a park uh, uh, covering the entire lower part of Manhattan. So again, this is a crisis response, but it's sort of standing on the shoulders of sort of the welfare city, and that the idea that this crisis that we're facing can actually be something fantastic for the city. And, and to me, that is, uh, that is maybe the most important uh, attitude here, that uh, the attitude among these architects is, of course, we're not doomed. This is an incredible opportunity to create a completely different new kind of, uh, of uh, urban space where there used to be infrastructure. So when the floods are, uh, will hit, as you see on the left, uh, this public space will function as a barrier, and when, the, when there is no water to the right, you will see it will be like a public space 
for all kinds of uh, facilities and clubhouses and, 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 and so forth. So that is a very important part of the architectural thinking of this uh, new generation that you mentioned and a way of dealing with uh, uh, this um, um, climate issue. Um, this is a project by, actually by the, the office I co-founded many years ago. I'm not part of it anymore. That's why they're doing so great now. <laughs> anyway, um, what we have is, of course, uh, as you may know, that the buildings and constructions account for 35% of global energy use and nearly 40% of CO2 emissions. So, if we want to solve this crisis, architects need to get to be and to get involved. And this is this is what they do uh, because we know that um, by 2050, three billion people will need new homes, and that's a fact. But the prices are going up, uh, as you all know, in cities like Paris and Copenhagen and London. And it means that only 7% of adults have access to formal housing finance. It will, it's very, very difficult uh, for people to afford living in the city. Uh, it's a historical change, as you may know. Think of Paris 30 years ago, or even 20 years ago. Uh, think of New York 30 years ago, Copenhagen 30 years ago. It's a completely different city. So we're rewriting the myth of the city. In, two or three decades, it's completely uh, turned around 180 degrees from an inclusive space to an exclusive space. And it's maybe one of the biggest uh, problems of our time. How do we supply uh, affordable housing uh, to the many? And I'm saying that without being political. It's just a fact that we need to address this issue. And um, with the sort of uh, affordable, uh, uh, adequate, uh, secure housing, and, and what they did was uh, quite um, uh, untraditional, or you could say um, interesting collaboration with IKEA, of all. As you know, it's a Swedish company. And what they did is this, uh, it's like a house, it's like a, uh, it's like a, a furniture. Uh, and they did this modular system. They actually just presented it, and it will be built. They presented it last week. And the idea is that a house um, is uh, designed for assembly and disassembly, and that, it's a, and that will drive the prices down. And you can actually establish uh, communities in the city uh, that are way more affordable and flexible um, and cross-generational. So you will actually uh, solve a lot of problems with this new housing concept. And it's interesting, of course, that IKEA uh, is, uh, is, uh, is trying to approach this uh, serious issue. But of course, it's related also to the climate crisis, because uh, architecture uh, um, uh, designed for disassembly is a way more sustainable way of designing, that you can actually take this apart very easily and reuse the materials. And it's possible to finance it. So there is this uh, great interest in understanding and exploring the possibilities, not only of solving the climate crisis, but also another crisis than uh, the crisis of affordable housing. So you might like say this is fantastic architecture, but it is an attempt, at least, to deal with, this, uh, with these issues. Um, Another project uh, that's uh, outside Copenhagen, it's called by the same office, called Regent Villages. It's uh, a community of completely self-sufficient uh, sort of uh, community where they produce their own energy and their own food, and it's cross-generational. Um, it's again an attempt to say, uh, how can we deal with this crisis without sort of limiting our options and without compromising sort of architectural quality and design? So what they've do, done is that they've uh, started the, uh, building uh, a community where you will actually uh, grow your own food. Um, and uh, it's, I think it's called hydroponics or something, where you will actually grow a uh, salad in these sort of uh, high-rise high uh, shelf systems. And what you see on the floor here, uh, it's actually sort of a, a pond with fish that would produce uh, the manure that you need to grow the salad. So it's a completely uh, circular system, and it actually works. It has been tested, uh, where the people uh, who actually live in this community all, all contribute to the production of food, and it lowers the costs of living there, and they produce their own energy. 
So what you have is like a, a new kind of uh, lifestyle because the crisis sort of challenges the way we live. And so instead of saying, you know, it's all horrible, we need to have cold baths and, and turn down the heat and everything will be uh, absolutely uh, ridiculously <laughs> bad, we can actually gain a lot and uh, address some of the, the issues of uh, loneliness and all this other you know, community that is also uh, sort of uh, challenging uh, our cities today. This idea of uh, design by, uh, to uh, disassembly is uh, something another office uh, named uh, Kube, uh, uh, Martin mentioned them as well, they did the urban uh, scale projects we saw before. They've just uh, finished this project. It's a recharge station, it's a gas station, so to speak, for electrical vehicles. And it's completely built to be disassembled and can be reused and put up anywhere. It's a modular system again. And, and that is a recurring theme, as you can, uh, as you can tell. It's a flexible uh, system, but it's also designed on the same principles, that every uh, resource we use can be put into reuse, and it's a circular uh, thinking that is really uh, gaining momentum right now, and as I said, will reshape this whole idea of structuralist modular thinking in architecture. It's, uh, it's uh, sort of the new, uh, the new thing in this generation. And the good news is, of course, they're not only talking about it, they're actually doing it. So this idea that a gas station could be sort of also a recreational facility, that you always double pro program things. Um, uh, as I said, the post-industrial city, the harbor transformation will leave a lot of uh, sort of industrial building mass to be reused. Of course, the worst thing you can do is sort of in a climate perspective is, is to tear it all down and build, some, build something new. So right now, across Copenhagen, we see reuse of old industrial facilities. So what we say is that one man's trash is another man's treasure that you can actually take these uh, old uh, industrial facilities that nobody is using, that are completely downtown, central, close to the water that is now clean and in Blue Park, recreational space, and turn it into something extraordinary. So you have these old industrial facilities that is slowly uh, being sort of reshaped into housing all over Copenhagen. Unfortunately, not enough, I would say, but it is happening and it's completely reshaping the city. Turn it into, as these, actually these apartments are the most expensive apartments in, in the in entire Copenhagen. So I'm not saying it's affordable housing, but at least it's uh, sustainable. And it completely lush because you have the industrial scale of the, of the, of the, um, of the, um, of the facilities and it turns into really extraordinary housing. Uh, Housing, because what you all know is the market does not produce this kind of space because it's not um, profitable. So what we see is that it's actually when we convert or transform the industrial facilities in a sustainable way, we get this really, really exclusive and fantastic uh, interiors. And I th again, I would say it's, it's uh, this combination of... Um, I think it's to say it's win-win, right? That you actually use your design skills and you invest your creativity in designing spaces that solve more than one problem. It's actually, it's actually solving the crisis of the post-industrial city, the welfare city gone mad, uh, with new kind of program and new, kind of, uh, new kinds of possibilities. Um, that's actually 15 minutes. Hola. Uh, and then, uh, Ingrid, you asked us, I don't know if you want to do this now. Sure. You asked us if, to, to present something, you know, that we, is that too early? Yeah. Maybe. That's too early. Okay, okay. Let's go one, let's go back one. Uh, I thought it would be nice maybe to ask the public if they have questions yeah. first. If you are interested to go a bit if you are interested to be uh, to go a bit further uh, and maybe more into details with specific question on architectural architectural aspects or urbanistic aspects, but, no. yeah. uh, but maybe I have questions then. Vous vouliez nous dire quelque chose? Non, parce qu'on m'entend pas. C'est ça. 
We hear everything. Ah, non, non, mais c'est gentil. Bon, pas de questions. Mais on peut en avoir après. OK, no questions. So maybe we'll have later, more questions later. Oh. Mike, please, Mike, please. The gentleman speaking without a mic, we can't hear him. The sound doesn't get to the... No, but it made no sense. This building, the last one, yeah. uh, with, with uh, the huge uh, volume inside, and, yeah. uh, probably uh, uh, for rich people, I don't know. But is it expensive to repair such building if you try to be not to, to, to put too much money? Yeah, it was actually. It's expensive? No, it's not. No. It, it was possible to do it. Yeah. And uh, I was surprised when I saw the numbers. I can't remember right now, but it was like uh, quite cheap. Of course, it's, this, the location is amazing, so the prices go up. Uh -huh. It's like right next to the water and everything is, 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 is extraordinary in that sense. But, but it, is, it is possible to do it. Um, Cheaply. Yeah. yeah. Because my idea is to put some high key uh, IKEA uh, houses inside the volumes. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, you could I would do like that. to do that. Yeah, you could do that. You have you two or that. three levels inside this volume. True. <laughs> True. That's my, my point. Thank you. No, it's really important for the translation. Ah, ah, yeah, Hi, I just for the last speaker, Chris, Christopher, sorry. Uh, Christoph? I just, Christoph, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm just interested because you spoke about in the title of the success and failure of the welfare city. I'm just interested in what exactly, I mean, I don't know anything about architecture, but the point came across of the strengths, what we can do with what we've got to turn a crisis into an opportunity. Yeah. But what was the failure of it? Like that, my question is that the success has come across like quite clearly. Yeah. But what was the, I don't know if, chronologically success and failure or failure yeah. and success or he has yeah. what was the failure of the welfare city that's why i call it a paradox because it's not obvious uh, but the numbers are clear gentrification is happening people are being pushed out of the city and the city carbon footprint is insane like it's it's a lush city it's a wealthy city but our carbon footprint is too big so we need to find a way to build because uh, we live in an expensive, like uh, it's expanding. Copenhagen is expanding, so we're building a lot. It's a very popular city, so we need to do that in a sustainable way. So we need new technologies uh, to involve new technologies to do that. And so that's kind of like a crisis that is sort of, I think, part of the modern city. That the way we build modern cities next to the water, like harbor cities, will not be sustainable when floods will come and, and sea level will rise. So even though we are sort of, right now, it's perfect. The water is clean. You can do anything. You have bicycle, a fantastic bicycle culture. You have lush urban plazas. You have everything. But just around the corner, uh, it will be uh, a complete, and the city is not prepared for what's just around the corner. So that's the crisis. That's the failure that we did not see that coming early enough. Can we say that the failure lays also on the fact that we are not able, rather in Copenhagen or other big cities, to organize a dynamic that leads people out of the main cities and we have the same kind of elements uh, being built elsewhere. So people feel like there is other wonderful place to live rather than Copenhagen. Would that be part of the failure? Because we don't see that so much happening right now, do we? I'm not sure. Like, do you mean that it's attractive to move out of the city? And yes, because we're still piling up. Yeah, but the thing is, to me, uh, the city, both as a myth, but also as some, is something very real that's to do with, with cultural institutions, uh, power networks, you know, being close to politics, being close to, to uh, influential networks. So being in the city is something essential to a certain kind of lifestyle and uh, certain kind of possibilities, educational uh, institutions, and, and so on. So the crisis, to me, has to be solved within the city. And it's a dual crisis, as I said. It's, it's, it's to do with climate adaptation, climate change, but it's also to, to do with affordability. And, and I think what we see uh, with this, that's why I, I brought the IKEA project, because uh, what I see is that we really need to combine the two. 
<laughs> to make it affordable. And that's really difficult, obviously, but to, to make it both affordable and uh, climate friendly at the same time. And that's just, and, and architecture is an extremely conservative business. It's slow, it's a slow art form, right? And it's super conservative. The way you create value in the building industry is so fixed. So to, to change that, it's just a very fundamental change in the thinking and doing of a, a lot of people. And to me, to see the young architects actually investing their creativity, coming up with new, these new projects that actually show us a better lifestyle than we have right now, solving those two problems, is just fantastic because architects, I don't think, for a long time, at least in Denmark, haven't invested their creativity in sort of political or societal issues. They've been great designers. They're wonderful designers. Mm -hmm. But uh, do they actually deal with the real uh, sort of hard issues? Now they do. Mm -hmm. And that happened like within the last sort of five, ten years. Mm -hmm. So it's really yeah, very really new. recent, obviously. Mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, just no. yeah, don't be. That's the whole meaning of this. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, it's the last question I ask, I'm sorry, but it's just a follow-up from what you were saying. Is it okay? Thank you. Uh, sorry, it's just that um, I appreciate that uh, this is all, like as I understand, like mostly private initiatives in partnering with uh, enterprises like IKEA, but what I'm seeing, and again, I know nothing about architecture, I've only been to Copenhagen like for two weeks in my life, I don't know what I'm talking about in a way. But what I'm saying is that there is people who can afford to move into these very like solid, secure houses, uh, kind of like uh, reconditioned for the climate crisis that we are facing. And we have uh, private enterprises fabricating this portable, kind of like post-industrial houses. They don't seem very... How do you say disassemble, this, uh, this assemblage, like the ones that you can build and build them off and just move them anywhere. You have potentially working class people, you have people who cannot access a house uh, in the conventional way that we are supposed to think about it right now. You have, uh, yeah, you have the working class people moving into not so safe, not so strong, not so stable houses in this new, I, I, I don't know how to phrase it, but I mean, I don't see, It's on the hands of private enterprises. It's on the hands of, I don't see the state anywhere here. I don't see, uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's just, it looks very nice, like the initiative, it looks really, it looks attractive, but for the, yeah, I, I just see a perpetuation of the, the rich will be safe and will have strong houses and the poor one will have to go to like a, disposable houses that are more at the mercy of climate crisis. Sorry, I, it's a very convoluted. I don't know how to express it, sorry. Mm. Just, just to com comment on that, I, maybe Christopher doesn't want to be political, but I, I think you're onto something. I think it's very much a political question also to decide what kind of politics do you have, what kind of frameworks do you establish within this city politically. Uh, and of course the market does respond to that, but it's something you can decide politically. What what kind of development do you want? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. But of course, the state, the state's power is under pressure by global forces. So it's it's not so easy as it might have been, maybe 50 uh, or five decades ago or something, where we had a stronger state. Um, but but I think it's still possible to respond politically to to some of these questions. At least try to. If I can just also answer. It's not an unstable uh, building uh, structure at all. It's perfectly, uh, it's perfectly fine, and it's uh, and it's not working class. That's a new thing. It's middle class. Uh, it's actually the middle class who are not, and the working class, obviously, who are not able to live in the city right now. So it's 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 really at least in coming. So these are not like a, this is not bad housing at all. Affordable housing is of course always difficult when it comes to sort of detailing. You know, uh, but uh, but the idea is, of course, that it should be really uh, high standard uh, living conditions. Actually, so and what you see actually, a big uh, Bjarkeins group did a project uh, which was uh, affordable housing by um, sort of this uh, in Copenhagen as well, and this it's very cheap, but the spatial qualities of that place is way higher 
than some of the most expensive buildings on the harbor front. Why is that? Because on the harbor front, when you build a, a so housing there, you, don't, you can sell anything, right? So you don't really care about the quality because you can sell it whatever. Uh, but when actually you do affordable housing, you have a very low budget, you really, really, really have to make an effort <laughs> and invest all your creativity into doing. So these are like um, uh, rooms with like uh, three and a half meters to the ceiling. It's like immensely with the glass facade. It's incredible space. The quality sort of and the luxury feeling of that place, the affordable housing, is higher than uh, most of the very expensive housing on the harbor front. And that is, of course, it's got to do with economy. And, but, it's, but it's also how much you know, architects invest in this. You know? Are they willing to do affordable housing and not all, all do a fantastic cultural buildings and so on? The best, if the best architects invest their creativity in these issues, it will be fantastic, I would say. And beyond politics, actually. <laughs> Within the existing economy, it is possible. Was there a question at the back? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's a little bit uh, going further on the same question, but these very interesting uh, green infrastructures for new ecosystems uh, and for water stalling, uh, especially for the first from that the, the first speaker was showing. Um, what, what, to what extent is the, the government, the city government and the, the national government uh, supporting these uh, projects? Is there a policy for it or how, or is it just project by project or is there a policy for a more general approach? Mm. Um, yeah, there is, uh, as I mentioned, the municipality of Copenhagen has put down a plan for this climate adaptation that will last for the next 20 years. So uh, a lot of these adaptation projects are handled by the municipalities, not at state level, um, but at a municipal, level, um, at municipal scale, uh, which also means that different municipalities in Denmark handle it very differently. So some municipalities have very ambitious strategies, as Copenhagen, I would say, is, is that's quite an ambitious strategy, but it's also a relatively rich city or municipality, whilst other municipalities in, in Denmark do not have this, uh, the same level of, of, uh, of uh, dealing with these problems. So it's, it's quite different, but of course there's also a lot of inspiration from one municipality to another. If there are good examples somewhere, it might inspire others to, to do something similar. Yeah. Um, so the, the execution of uh, these projects are financed by, um, by the municipality, as, as you could see, for instance, with this transformation of this neighborhood, the final one that I showed you, uh, whilst others in the uh, research and educational facility that was sponsored by a huge uh, private sponsor. That, um, so there were public money, but also private money in that project. So it's sometimes a mix. Uh, but uh, if it's public infrastructure, streets, then it's usually the municipality that, that uh, sponsors that. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff. Yes, I'm Plenar Helgason, and thank you for your really exciting presentation. But I want to ask you a question about the historical factor in a way, because uh, up until the 1970, Danish middle class uh, buildings were usually very modest and practical and uh, under the international style. Uh, around that time also the warning bells were starting to, 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 to go off with Victor Paponek, I think, writing Design for the Real World in 1975, which was sort of an a call out for architects and designers to start actually designing for actually the situation that was evident by then. So now it's, it's really a relief to see that Danish designers are starting to do that at the moment, but do you have any explanations about why on earth did it take such a long time to move from being sustainable to getting in there again? Thank you. It's a very, very good question. Um, 
I think it has to do with sort of the the way you, the profession sort of reflects and deals with uh, political issues. I think at least in 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 in, in the coping context, the academy, the way uh, the focus, strong focus on art, you know, <laughs> the golden age of Danish design. And as you know, in the 60s and 70s politics, you know, a lot of architects actually graduated from the academy without drawing anything. They just wrote manifests, you know, <laughs> praising Marx. <laughs> it was a very sort of a left-wing tendency. And so in the 80s and 90s, everything, there was a huge sort of economic crisis, obviously, and everything became very introverted and very focused on, on the art side of architecture, right? <laughs> so all of a sudden, there's this new, uh, awakening, I would almost say, or focus on society again because society in general is, is the attention is shifting, and uh, the end users are asking, you know, this, this, some of these questions: What will happen? How is this uh, building sustainable? And politicians are starting to change the law. The building regulations are changing, so that's why I said it's a bit. It's a conservative business. It's a slow art form. But, it's, but, but now it's finally happened. <laughs> and I think the, the overall urgency of the climate crisis is, is, is really evident uh, to a lot of architects. And what I think is, uh, what makes me optimistic is that there actually you see it across generations as well. We're talking about a younger generation of architects, but it's actually across generations in, in Danish architecture. So it's more the well-established companies as well, like Henning Larsen Architects or CF Müller and so forth, who are trying to reorient uh, their businesses and their creativity into this, and it's 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 massive change. It's massive change, and it will change Danish architecture. It is right now. Yeah, um, I think. It, thanks for the question. It's a very good question, and I think it's also one that can be addressed concerning the climate crisis in general. Since there's been a lot of knowledge about climate change for decades, and why have people not reacted or responded to that? I think. Um, I mean, that's a general question also of how, how to go from knowledge to action. What, what does it take to actually do something about things? I think one of the explanations is that people need some sort of evidence. They actually need to feel the impact on their own lives. And one of the, at least one example of what, what has changed or what has happened in Copenhagen is that there was, even though the municipality had already started their uh, strategy of climate adaptation in 2010, Right after that, in 2011, there was a really, really heavy rainstorm in Copenhagen that flooded so many basements and streets and actually caused uh, uh, damages for, I think it was almost a billion euro, uh, or a million euro, or a billion euro, a billion euro. So really, really costly damages were caused by this, and that really made people change their minds and actually uh, started to think about action, we need to do something about this, because otherwise there might be similar incidents that will create the same uh, damages, and it's very, very costly. So it's, it's also from a very rational point of view to sort of uh, not uh, have the same losses again. Uh, but people had to have these images of flooded streets before they were actually turning to action. Hello, I have a question myself. Madam, could you wait, madam? Could you wait? Could you wait, madam? Because they lost the beginning. Could you wait? Anyway, she's not listening to me. So why are we always focusing on cities? She said, why are we focusing on cities? I was discussing at the bookshop here. Someone is selling a book on a tiny theater, cinema theater in Laval, which is uh, in the middle of nowhere, Laval. Anyway, and they just cannot do anything about the city, in France at least. If you take the example of Brittany, this is off the place. We have places that are getting developing around uh, Rennes city, 40 kilometers away from Rennes. We feel there is that heavy sign. Everyone goes to the same places, at, you know, next to the sea. And now I think about the smaller cities. So when I was discussing, hey, 10 minutes, 
that woman from that Laval of the place. I myself live 20 kilometers from her and I've uh, in Brittany and I've never been there. It's it's in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, that my question is why are we always focusing on cities? In the same cities. It's like an ideology we just cannot go beyond that idea of in fact Uh, there should be some activities in other places. I'm sure there are cultural associations everywhere in so many uh, small cities in France, but people are afraid to leave Paris, to leave uh, major cities, Bordeaux, Paris, whatever, to go and do things elsewhere. Other, it's always the same city, and it's all the same cities that are deserted by others. I have an explanation. It's a comment, and I'm not an architect myself. Into mic, into mic, into mic, everyone, please. Okay, so I, I don't know if I answer in English, or if I have a, a beginning of an answer in English or in French, but en français. Oui? Well, maybe in English, so you can follow also. Is, I'm, I'm guessing uh, that this question is, of course, quite complex because there are so many factors and um, and in Paris c'est banal hein? so c'est juste un commentaire yes, but it's, it's, a, it's a question of today mm? and uh, when you think that you want to take a train instead of taking the plane to go from one point to another and you realize there's no more night trains so we can see that we have developed a whole economy a certain way to a certain direction I guess we all agree on that and What uh, Martin and Christopher have described, I think it's a new paradigm. Then we like it or we don't like it, but it's a fact. We're going to have to change. And that's the beginning of answers. It can shock us. Some people will like it, some people won't. But the fact is, it's changing and we need to change. And of course, we have to take into consideration the climate crisis, but it doesn't go without taking into consideration the social crisis. They are linked, obviously. And so what you're stressing out, without going into politics, we can agree or not agree, or agree or not agree about liking the aesthetic of this project. But collectively, a uh, uh, beginning of a thinking has to raise. And I think that what Christopher showed very well, and Martin as well, is that it has started. And that's what is exciting about Copenhagen, I think, because as a citizen, because I wanted to present myself here with two specialists in architecture, as a citizen, it was incredible to see the changes of this city. It has grown so fast that it, it is really impressive. Maybe you want to ask yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Thank, thank you for the for the comment. I, I completely agree. There's what about the question of the the sort of outskirts or the non-urban areas of of countries? The tendencies that you experience in France are happening in Denmark as well, uh, we, and it's also a social crisis that that was pointed out before. Um, I think one of the reasons why we're pointing to what's happening in the cities. It, One, um, one point is that it, there's a concentration of, of, of finances, of course, so that's really where things are being built. And it's the opposite in, in the outskirts. We have shrinking cities, so we have actually too much uh, being built, or there are too many buildings, actually. So it's a, different, uh, it's a different challenge there. Should we demolish? Should we just abandon? Uh, certain villages, or what about the infrastructure that Ingel was also pointing to? So, so it's different kind of of, uh, of questions in in the more rural areas. I think in certain parts you would see that there are certain areas that have the potential to redevelop and revigorate themselves. For for instance, uh, with uh, accommodating tourism, uh, there are some potential some in some places, but actually to establish new working places, maybe new industry. It's, it's really difficult in, in very many places because of this infrastructure and yeah, the attractiveness of urban life that we see today. Do, do you have... Uh, yeah. Maybe we can... Uh, if, if there is no more question, because we don't have too much time, but uh, Martin and Christopher uh, took the time to um, collect more slices. So you can see the more example of what I've been created. Would you like that? Yeah. 
Yes, two mics. Yeah, actually, I think we, because um, Ingrid asked us to, um, yeah, Ingrid asked us if we had some favorite projects. And I think it actually fits very well into where the discussion is heading right now. Because uh, I think both of us actually picked projects that are outside of Copenhagen. And this project is uh, the one that I've chosen. I, I must admit I've never been there. But uh, I think it's a, it looks like a very, very lovely project. It's in, <laughs> it's in Renköping, so it's actually the western part of Denmark. Uh, Copenhagen is on the very east, eastern part of, of uh, Denmark, and this is to the west. So it's a very rural area. Uh, it was a project that was sponsored by a private foundation, and they came up with this project to create facilities essentially for tourism in an area where there are not so many working places, and there is this sort of stagnating economy. And I think the office here, it's called uh, Johansen Skolstel. It's a very young copenhagen based uh, office, and they built some very light structures in this. It's uh, an area where people go bird watching, so there are flocks of birds coming into this very, very flat land facing the western coast of, of Denmark. Uh, so this is a bird watching tower. They also uh, refurbished and rearranged some existing structures there. You can't see that here, but I think this is just an example of this very minimal structure that sort of upgrades an area, and I think it enhances also the landscape. It just adds, adds quality to... It's very, very minimal. Very, very minimal. Very, very minimal. Almost industrial. It's comparable to some of the rural structures that you would see in the farming structures that you would see in this area, but it has this simplicity uh, to it, this... It's a triangular in shape, you can see, and it sort of expands towards the top of it. Uh, so I think it's just very beautiful, very simple, and it adds quality to an area that's struggling, but hopefully it will help attract people and create maybe some new jobs for people living there. Well, also, thank you for commenting. I think uh, the cities are sort of part of the problem and part of the solution. So, I mean, the attractiveness and uh, the economy of, of sort of urban life seems to attract people. <laughs> and so the basic concept of a city is such a strong concept that I don't think we will, uh, we will uh, leave it right away. But I do think, I've read an interesting article, the, the sort of the president of Mercedes-Benz, you know, talking about self-driving cars and uh, mobility. And, and he said, he predicted that in... 15, 20 years, of course we will have self-driving cars, so you can actually live quite a long way outside, uh, outside, the, outside the city, and you can actually go up, get up early, and get in your car, and you can start working in your car, and you can, or you can sleep, or you can do other things. So it will sort of change the, the, the settlement pattern drastically, probably, and relieve some of the, the pressure uh, from the cities. And, and so things will change, I think. But right now, I think cities are part of the, the solution. And as, as you all also know, that compact living is also uh, the most sustainable living. I mean, the most uh, polluted cities in the world are, are sort of car cities, sprawling American car cities like LA or San Francisco and so on. Well, maybe not San Francisco, actually, <laughs> but LA. Uh, so, um, but I've chosen a project that is actually uh, all the way to the west on the west coast of, uh, of Denmark. It's uh, by the, what do you call this in, in English, actually? Uh, yeah, but the, the, the location, the, the uh, Vatten Vell, well, it's a very spectacular, the yeah, it's a, it's a very spectacular sort of um, coastal uh, location. And it's by uh, an office called Dortmund, and they're using old uh, sort of craftsmanship, uh, local vernacular, and transforming with the, with the contemporary architecture into so this uh, spectacular visitor center. But it's also funded by uh, a private foundation, actually. So we see that a lot, that the regional development is, is, is happening through uh, private investment or foundations investing in this. And I th think in Denmark, especially the foundations, the private money, it's very, very important to the, the sort of the design quality. Actually, all the projects that you will put forward has some kind of investments from foundations in them. And it's, 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 it's part of the whole ecosystem of money in, in Danish architecture. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about that, but of course, that's very important. 
And what they do is that they invest heavily in regional development. And, um, and I think it, it's, actually, it's actually working. Uh, uh, and what we will see is that it sort of counter sort of this movement towards the city. Uh, and you can actually see that architecture as a driver of development is, is, is real, uh, also in the outskirts and sort of the rural uh, areas. Um, so that's a very positive thing as well, that architects are actually able to do this. I'm glad you approached that as aspect. It's just because we were lacking time, because we almost uh, done, and I want to keep an eye on the time. Yes, it's almost finished. So I can ask you one question, maybe, if according to what you have showed, you know, there's, uh, the French know well uh, a uh, previous generation architect called uh, Jan Utzon, and um, another architect, Len Tranberg, she, um, she said how she was inspired by him, and many architects were inspired by him, and she said that he understands how to work with metaphors so that each building is embedded with fantastic narratives. Do you, say, do you think that um, contemporary architecture in Denmark can make the dream world, can make us dream? Do you think it's something that really now has a, uh, an identity and an international uh, future or present? Well, I think it should. I think it should make a stream because it's the art form that is actually showing us fantasies of how the world could be. You know, uh, every project before it's realized is going through a phase. You know, where renderings and drawings are being presented to the public, and they present an image of the future, obviously. And I think that's a great responsibility. Um, and. Talking about younger generation of Danish architects, they actually understand you know, the logic of a new media reality, where storylines and punchlines is almost like, I call them the megaphone generation. Uh, because they're so good at narratives. You see the, the, the big building with the ski slope on top of it. It's, it's, it's hedonistic, it's utopian, but it's pragmatic, it's real. Uh, so, and of course, they are seducing us. And I think they should, or at least they should try to do it through architecture and through those narratives and seduce us into a better future. So we can be critical, obviously, of what they do. There's a great debate in Denmark about architectural design. Whenever there's a, mm. you know, a design in the, in the city center, there will be mm. hefty debates you know, in newspapers all over the place. But at least they're trying to formulate sort of an image or create an image of a better future. And, and that is naive, maybe, uh, but it's just, it's just wonderful, you know, that they keep doing it. Um, I think when you look at some of these projects that we've been presented, um, I think you can see uh, an attention to the almost kind of metaphysical side of, or the potential uh, of architecture to create also symbolic meaning uh, to provide people with. I think the way that we've seen in some of these projects that architecture um, sort of articulates uh, landscape, the open sky, the horizon, uh, the way that materiality is uh, dealt with, uh, the aesthetics of nature and all these different kinds of plants that would surround you um, and just like open up to you with all uh, different kinds of senses being activated. I think um, that sort of aesthetics that has um, a symbolic meaning to it as well is, is definitely being articulated by some of these uh, projects that we've seen and, and by at least certain architects on the scene uh, of, of contemporary Danish architecture. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.